bruises never fade. Number 79. Jimmy, would you pray for our tithes and offerings tonight? <laughs> Thank you, Miss Robin. If you have your Bibles with you this evening, turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 4 tonight. Ecclesiastes chapter 4. So we're working our way through this last book of Solomon. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, starting in verse 1 this evening. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 1. So I returned, considered all the oppressions that are under the sun. Behold, the tears of such as were oppressed. They had no comforter. And on the side of the oppressors there was power, but they had no comforter. Wherefore I praise the dead, which are already dead, more than the living, which are alive. Yea, better is he both they, which hath not been, who hath not seen the evil work that is, under, that is done under the sun. Again, I considered all the travail and every right work, that for this man is envied of his neighbor. This also is vanity and vexation of spirit. The fool folded his hands together and eateth his own flesh. Better is a handful with quietness than both the hands full with travail and vexation of spirit. Then I returned and I saw vanity under the sun. There is one alone and there is not a second. Yea, he hath neither child nor brother, yet is there no end to all his labor. Neither is I satisfied with richness, neither saith he, For whom do I labor and bereave my soul of, of good? This also this is also vanity, yea, it is sore travail. Lord, we thank you again for this night. Help us, Lord, as we look into these words from your word and try to understand their meaning so they would help us in this life that you've given us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Tonight's message is, be careful which act you follow or 
In other words, be careful where you get your advice. It seems like everybody likes to give people advice, don't they? And the more, the more successful they are, the more they are liable to give you advice. If you see somebody with a Gatorade that you don't know, you think, well, who's that? But if you see LeBron James, you're thinking, well, I know who that guy is. Or Shaq or somebody other, some other sports figure, Tim Tebow. You say, well, I know who that is. But everybody likes to give advice. I heard a preacher say that <laughs> right after the New Year's, right during New Year, someone gave him a piece of paper and it was about advice on an exercise program. It says, number one, begin by standing on a comfortable surface where you have plenty of room on each side. With a five-pound potato bag in each, each hand, extend your arms straight out from your sides and hold them as long as you can. Number three, try to reach a full minute and then relax for a few minutes, then repeat the process three more times a day. After two weeks, move up to 10-pound potato bags and repeat the exercise each day. After you feel confident at this level, move up to a 25-pound bag and repeat the process. After you feel confident at this level, begin putting a potato in each bag. <laughs> I think we might be able to handle that exercise routine, right? <laughs> Maybe so. Maybe we can do that. A very wealthy person of the world gave, down, gave advice on a TV show, I won't tell you the person's name, but this was their advice. He said, associate yourself with high-grade people, people who, would like to be, who, who you'd like to be with. In other words, you might have to bump, dump the friends who, you're not, who, don't, who you don't like at your income level to be with other people because you like this person better. <laughs> he says, basically, associate with high-grade people. Invest in yourself, this person says, which is really nothing more than saying that you're the most important person in the world. You can tell this person is worldly. One more piece of advice that he gives, marry the right person, which is hard to interpret exactly what he means, because if you looked at his life, he left a person he'd married to for 25 years and married for 25 years and married someone about half his age. So just because someone gives you advice doesn't mean you should actually take their advice. The most important thing you can do in life is take in what you know is truth. Because who you will who you let advise you is who you eventually follow. That's why our number one, number one focus of truth is not found on the TV. It's not found in the constellations. It's not found on the internet. It's found in the word of God. If you want the source of truth, that which will give you truth every time, it's found in the Bible. And that's why we go and study it and read it. I don't give you the horoscope of the day. I don't tell you the uh, palm readings. I don't, we don't do any of the other stuff. We say, what does the Bible say? In America, in our lives, we need to get back to what does the Bible say? What does the Bible say? And that's what we're focusing on. That's what... That's what Solomon was focusing on. He was trying to give advice, as we as I mentioned before, primarily, I believe, for his son, but obviously other people to follow, as, he, as this was written by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But if you had to have some scenes of life that would help you, or what we see here actually in these verses, what would they be? What would the scenes of life be if we could write a script uh, for these words that we find in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. First of all, the heartless oppression. The heartless oppression, verse 1. Again, I saw all the pressures that are done under the sun. Behold, the tears of the oppressed. They had no one to comfort them. On the side of the oppressors there was, pow there was power, and there was no one to comfort them. So he used this word oppression three times in this opening verse. Notice how he used it to describe the actions around him. He saw the oppressions that are done. Then he, uses, then he uses it to describe the victims. Behold, the tears of the oppressed. Then, he say, then, then to say they have no recourse other than to, the tears of despair and grief. And the third, third time, Solomon uses it to describe the, the culprits. So you have the, oppression, the oppressions, the oppressed, and the oppressors. 
Is there oppress, oppression in life? I, was, I heard this, uh, this week that Norway invented the paperclip. And during the, uh, then during the oppression or occupation of the Germans, they would wear their paperclip on their clothes as a sign of rebellion against Germany. Now you learned something you didn't know when you walked in this place. So maybe you want to wear a paperclip. I don't know. <laughs> but we're, there's, a, there's oppression everywhere. Think about, the, think about those poor cities on the, the border of Mexico and Texas right now who have been inundated by nearly 10,000 people a day. From not just Venezuela or Panama, now from Africa, China, Europe. Imagine living on the border and seeing people constantly invading your property. We had a meeting at the HOA the other night, and I, met, I brought up the fact that I didn't like the fact that golfers came on my property and busted my windows with their, and that's just every once in a while. But imagine hundreds and thousands of people on your property all the time, and you couldn't stop it. What would you do? What are they doing? Or some of them are busting them up to New York or other places like that. But there's oppression all, all over. All you have to do is look in the newspaper for five minutes. This idea of the oppressor, he might be a husband, might be a parent, might be a bully at school, might be a dictator in a country, a sex slave, or an abortionist, a gang leader, a pimp, an employer with a suit or a child abuser. But the corruption begins in a person's heart. The, the most... Wicked thing about us is a heart. We are, we, we are deceived by thinking, and people think, well, oh, people have a good heart. No, we don't have a good heart. We have a wicked heart, as Jeremiah tells us. It's, a, it's the heart. The, it's in the heart that the deception and the root of all evil is found in not just that, that organism which beats with blood, but the, the heart in the Bible is the center of man's being. I heard recently about a teenager who saw an elderly man was walking down the way in a cane, and the teenager made a U-turn, went back and ran over the gentleman on the, in, with the cane. And the police, when they finally showed up and saw what was done, asked the young teenager, why did you do that? He said, I just wanted to feel what it, see what it felt like to kill somebody. Folks, if you and I just knew the horror of what happened in Gainesville would probably go half insane. Just what, what goes on in Gainesville at night. But what do you think about Atlanta or Tallahassee or Jacksonville? The evil that's done. There's oppression everywhere. And so Solomon is seeing this having lived many years and he's, he's, it, 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 it's weary to him. You ever get weary of the sins of our country? You get weary at the, uh, the statistics of abortion. You get weary at, the, at the, the wickedness of our country. I mean, especially if you've been watching the news the last couple of days about what's come out recently about the FBI and the CIA and all their false claims about Trump and Russia. <laughs> all of it was a sham. And it's happening not just in the United States. It's happening everywhere. Lies and betrayal, you don't know who to believe. Except for you know the word of God is true. That's why we have to continue in this wicked world that wearies us. <laughs> and we're like, how, how can, God, how long, how, how long can you, can you stand the wickedness of, of mankind? His long suffering is past what we can even comprehend. And Solomon has come to the place where he sees the wickedness, the oppression of the world, and he's wearied. He's frustrated because he sees it and he understands it. He acknowledges it. Job 16, verse 2, I have heard many such things. Miserable are, are, ye, are ye comforters, are you all? <laughs> in the midst of his trouble, in the midst of his difficulty, he was looking for hopefully some friendship. But even his friends turned on him. Someone said, 
Recently, if you have five friends in this world, you are doing very well. You're a wealthy person. Most of us do not have five friends. That we could say friends. Friends meaning if you call them in the middle of the day and you're stuck on 75 and it's a hot day like it is today and they, you know they would drop everything they, they could drop and they would come and help you on a hot day. That type of friend. Do you have five friends like that? If you have five friends in a lifetime like that, you're, you're a very wealthy person. Job, <laughs> he lost all he had. He, he lost his health. His wife said, curse God and die. And here you have three friends that come, ultimately four, and they say, they, they just tell him how bad he is. And he calls them miserable comforters. I read this illust- uh, the Bible, a biblical illustration of the dealing unjustly or unkindly by the person over whose time, goods, and trade is business, the oppressor hath power, is principally the vice of rich men and superiors who have power over their workmen, servants, tenants, other inferiors. Which, of course, we've seen through the history of the world. When people have power, people have uh, uh, ability, sometimes they use that, unfortunately, many times to oppress those around us. Not all the time, but generally speaking. The heartless oppression, we read through it, we see in, we see it throughout, throughout history, even in, throughout the Bible. Psalm 119, 78, Let the proud be ashamed, for they dealt perversely with me without a cause, but I will meditate in thy precepts. Psalm 119, 79, Let those that fear thee turn unto me, and those that have known my testimony. Psalm 119, 80, Let my heart be sounded in thy statutes, that I be not ashamed. Psalm 119, 81, My soul fainteth for salvation, but I hope in thy word. Did, did David know something about oppression? Yeah, his own father-in-law, Saul, chased him. Why? Because he was a proud and jealous man. Tried to kill him. Tried to kill his own, his own son-in-law. I saw some of the places when I was over there in Israel, the caves that they believed that David would have been in. Beautiful area, though arid, beautiful. Waterfalls and caves. But can you imagine that, fearing for your own life because a family member wants to take you out? Secondly, not only do we see, first of all, this heartless oppression. Secondly, we see here, number two, this envious rivalry. rivalry. In verse four, again, I considered all the travail, every right work. That is for this a man is envied of his neighbor. This is also vanity, vexation of spirit. So he's saying basically there's, there's envy. There's strife, much as which I mentioned already. <clears throat> There's competition. <laughs> People are competitive. I read an article from the Harvard Business School. This man, this professor, wrote about the disturbing trend in business he calls comparison obsession. He writes that a former student of his graduated 10 years ago with a terrific job of Fortune 500 company suffers with comparison obsession. At least it seemed like a terrific job until she received her alumni newsletter and learned that a fellow alumnus who was now the MBA program in the MBA program with her uh, with her had just been named vice president at their company. From that moment, she could barely hold a conversation without bemoaning her lack of promotion. The professor goes on to write the business executives, Wall Street Analysts, lawyers, doctors, and other professionals equally obsessed with comparing their own achievements against those of others in the profession concludes people are increasingly trapped by their comparison. You know what what the Bible says about people who compare themselves with other people? It's not wise. Everybody has different gifts and talents and abilities. Just because you don't have to have the top job, maybe it's not God's will that you have that. But we don't, we don't focus on the will of God. We say, well, I want to be better at this. And there's nothing wrong in and of itself to want to be better. But if you're constantly comparing yourself with other people and not content where God places you, dear friend, you'll live a life of stress and anxiety. And I can tell you that's not healthy. No. We live in a world with Joneses who are trying to keep up with other Joneses. We're in a world of Joneses trying to keep up with other Joneses. Pastors are infected too. I was with about 30 pastors yesterday at a memorial service for my dear friend Tim Hawkins. 
One pastor wrote recently, he was sitting in his living room on a Sunday afternoon with his little six-year-old boy. His son just got out of the blue said, Daddy, when you sit up on the platform, just before you go up to preach, you sit there and bow your head. What are you doing? His father answered, I'm asking the Lord to give me a good sermon, son. His son replied, well, why doesn't he do it? He told his son, go to your room. <laughs> <laughs> it's easy to forget the sin of envy even in the assembly of the local church. A.W. Tozer put it, we forget the lessons that Christians were not to be competitors. We're to be co-laborers. We're a body. We're a body of believers. We see that in, in Corinthians. We're, 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 we're all on the same team. We're rowing the same way. The same direction. We, we're not competing. We're not competitors. We're not jealous. We ought to be grateful and thankful. Everybody has different gifts. Aren't you glad? I, I'm, I'm glad you see the analogy in Corinthians that Paul makes. I'm glad not everybody's an eye. We don't need all eyes. <laughs> I'm glad everybody's not a foot or a hand or a head or a heart or a picky toe. We're different. Thank God we're all different. That makes up the body of Christ. And dear friend, let me just say this about a church. You don't have to like everything about a church. Some people say, well, you know, I, I like to sing, but I don't like to fellowship. I've had people say that. I said, I've heard people say, I like to fellowship, but I don't like to sing. Some people say, I, 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 like, uh, I like this, I, I like this, but I don't like that. Well, dear friend, that's just natural. That's natural. I have food on my plate. I cook some, I cook some, I cook some uh, pork, chops, pork chops this afternoon. And you know what? Some people like... There was, there was potatoes and broccoli, and I'm not too, I'm not too keen on carrots, but I ate a few because I know they're good for me, and, but I'm sure other people like them, like family members like them more. And that's just life. You don't have to like everything. You don't like everything, a part of it. But we're on the same team. We're on the same team. Tozer said it's a fact. That the Christian race is contest, but it's no sense in competition between believers, between churches. As we live the faith, the life of faith, we're Christians are never in competition, but with other Christians. Envious rivalry. First Corinthians chapter 12, verse 25. That there should be no schism. That's division in the body. But the members should have the same care one for another. Whether one member suffer, all members suffer. Whether one member be honored, all members rejoice with it. Now you're the body of Christ and members in particular. And as we see the scriptures, when something happens great for one member, we ought to rejoice. When someone is promoted, is, has a promotion in the church, uh, whether it be physically or, or at, at, at work or financially, we ought to rejoice. When someone gets married or someone gets a new car or someone, someone you know, something happens to them, we ought to, as a body of believers, we ought to be, be thankful and grateful. But the counter-wise, when someone is going through a hard time, when someone has financial loss, when someone gets bad news, when th someone goes through difficulty, we ought, to, we ought to come together and weep. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. That's what we did with Brother Chuck. When Brother Chuck fell, but I thank God for the church rallied around him and showed love and compassion and care and showed up at the house down there. Man, I came to that house and it seemed like half the church was at the house. Helping out, painting, sweeping, cleaning, every which way. And none of us knew what we were doing. We were just doing the best we could. <laughs> well, some of you knew better than others, I better say. <laughs> I don't want to offend anybody. But we rallied her against it. And that's just not for him. I think that'd be true of any of us, right? That's what, that, and that's what a body, that's what a group of people who care about another. If we say we're a loving church care, <laughs> seeking a living Savior, that's just what we do. That's just what we do. Thirdly, arrogant laziness. Verse 5, the fool folded his hands together and eat his own flesh. That's pretty bad, isn't it? Better is a handful of quietness than both the hands with full of travail and vexation of spirit. Laziness. The fool folded his hands together and eat his own flesh. That's pretty gross, isn't it? He's so lazy, so, so pitiful, he, he, he can't even go out and take care of himself. He does, well, what is that saying? Basically, his laziness is destroying himself. It's destroying himself. Work is a good four-letter word, folks. 
before the fall, God commanded Adam to work. Name all the animals. That had to be some work. <laughs> Can you imagine coming up with the name orangutan? I want to ask Adam, where'd you come up with orangutan? How'd you name rhinoceros? <laughs> I want to ask him. I know oh, now cat. Okay, I got the cat. Tiger, lion. But some of these names, um, zebra, you know, how did you come up with giraffe? I mean, tell me, how'd you, how did you do it? I just want to sit down with a conversation with Adam and tell me how you, how, what was it? I believe, I believe Adam was a pretty smart individual. And uh, your dear friend, laziness is a, is a, is a, is a horrible thing. And we, and we all, to some degree, struggle with it. We all struggle with it. We must fight against it. Ask God to help us when we do struggle. <clears throat> Proverbs 6, 9, it's throughout the Bible. How long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard? When wilt thou rise out of sleep? Yeah, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little forward in the hands of sleep. So shall thy poverty come as the one that travaileth, and as they want as an armed man. Wow. We see laziness all around we, don't we? Just drive down the road, look at the street. See laziness all around us. Proverbs 26, 15, the sloth will hide his hand in his bosom. Agree with him to bring it out and get in his mouth. He's too lazy to bring it out. The sluggard is wiser his own conceit than seven men that render a reason. A sluggard always has a reason why he won't work. Too tired, too hurt, too sad, not appropriate time, too hot, too cold. Why? What's what it is? Just don't want, it's just don't want to. I have the greatest respect for a homeless person who just say, you know what, I'm homeless and I want to be homeless, and that's just the way I am. Don't give me a sob story. Well, you know, I left my wallet at the, at the gas station. Or I was just driving through the area, and I'm on my way to New York, and I need to, I need to need $20. $20, they didn't get you in New York. I don't care what type of vehicle you got. No, man, if you're going to be honest and want money, just say, hey, I'm lazy, I'm no good, and I just need some money. Would you help me? I, I, I'd almost give somebody money just for being honest. If they just were honest, but I, I, don't, I think I've maybe found one honest bum in my whole life. <laughs> you can't find them. <laughs> just tell the truth. <laughs> I don't want to work. Can you give me some money? <laughs> That's what they should have a sign. I'm a lazy bum. I don't want to work. Please, please pay me. I bet you that joke would be the richest person in Gainesville. <laughs> just be, we just want some honesty because we hear all the lies all the time. <laughs> Number four, blind ambition. When I return and saw vanity under the sun, there's no one alone. There's not on a second. Yea, neither child nor brother, yea. Yet there's no one end of all his labor, neither is his eye satisfied with riches, neither saith he, For whom do I labor and bereave my soul of good? This is also vanity, yea, it is a is soul of short travail. What's he saying? Solomon describes a man who does not have an heir, does not have a family, does not have extended family, and whom he can have leave wealth. The implication is he's, he does not want a family. He just, want to, he just wants to be materialistic, and money is his God. This reminds me of Ebenezer Scrooge. Just conceited, self-focused, little love towards other people, just consumed an old miser that all they care about is their wealth. They're consumed with getting their own things, and it doesn't do them any good because they're consumed with it. He's describing it. So we see these four scenes describing four possibilities of listening to the wrong voice and following the wrong advice. Some pursue power, then misuse it. Some others work hard with hidden motive in their heart. Others decide to get, try to just get by. They fold their hands in self-interest and arrogance and demand to be served by other people. And others, others never take a breath. They never start churning away. They're counting their coins or their trophies or their toys. They never seem to notice that everyone has slipped away and left them in their self-absorbed world all alone. And that's what, the, that's what ultimately it will be. You either focus on your stuff, what you can get, or on other people. But in the midst of all this, one verse we didn't, I didn't really focus on is verse 6. 
It says, better is a handful with quietness than both the hands full with travail and vexation. The word quietness is a word that serves as a synonym, synonym for contentment. That's what God's desire for all of us to be. The godliness with contentment is great gain. And you see this in Philippians. Paul writing from, a, from, from jail, he said, I know how to be abased, I know how to abound. Right? He's, had, he's, been in, he's, been, he's going to be in palaces, he's going to be in prison. He knows how to be abased, he knows how to abound. And he knows how to suffer all things. But he was content. He was content. The question is, are we content where God wants us? Now, I'm not saying we should be content where we are spiritually. We should want to grow spiritually. You may have, in your career, you might want to, want to better yourself, more, want to get more education. Nothing wrong with that. But, dear friend, if we, if we continue to live in a sense of not being grateful and thankful for what we have and where we are and never feel the sense of contentment, then that's, I think that's a lack of spiritual gratefulness and thankfulness in our life. Be grateful and thankful where you are. Maybe God has you there for a reason and for a purpose. Paul was in prison for a reason and purpose. Paul the apostle, the Hebrews of the Hebrews, Pharisee of the Pharisees, says, who knew much of the Old Testament, had it memorized, he was in prison, yeah. And that's exactly where God would want him to be. His, he lost his, his life, yeah. That's exactly where God wants us to be. Don't get, rent, don't get caught up in this prosperity gospel that if things aren't perfect, things aren't great, that I must not be in God's will. No, dear friend. You could be going through difficulty, horror, and, horror and, and, and suffering and be exactly where God wants you to be. 55 years old, Tim Hawkins passed away. My friend I went to see yesterday. His memorial service. Does it make sense? Does it make sense? Here's this guy, musically, very talented, great preacher, gifted, in lots of ways, 55 years of age. That, that night before, this time last week, he was preaching from the pulpit from Lamentations chapter 3 about God's faithfulness. Next day, he got up the next morning, teaching, uh, went to a public school, teaching some kids about being, having right character. In the afternoon, he took some interns from the church, started teaching them and, and helping them and investing in their life. Got in the car, getting ready to go to Cheesecake Factory to meet some friends of, of his and mine. Thankfully, somebody was with his wife. When they called around, called around, couldn't get him, couldn't get him, couldn't get him. Finally found out he was in a car, found a car unresponsive. Called the hospital, found out he was gone. He was gone, 55 years of age. Only one life, which will soon be passed. Only what's done for Jesus Christ will last. Are you content or where God has you in your life? All right, yeah, seeking to be better, hopefully growing, growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Are you at peace with yourself? Are you grateful and thankful for what God has done with your life? I hope so. A lot of people look at this old world and they say, Ah, I wish, I'm always wish I could have this, I wish I could do this, I wish I could do that. I was thinking about this person, Angie was reading a book by this guy, Nick Vujacic. I think how you pronounce it, right? He's an Australian-American motivational speaker, author who was born with tetraamelia syndrome, a rare disorder characterized by the absence of arms and legs. Nick was over, overcome with many challenges in his life, but he was always, always remained positive and hopeful. He's the author of several books, including Life Without Limits and Stand Strong. He, was, he also appeared in several films and television shows. He's a passionate advocate for people with disabilities and travels the world speaking to audiences, you just, you just look on YouTube and you hear him speak and it's like, wow. Here's this guy who goes up and down stage with no arms and no legs and he's speaking. Instead of focusing on what he doesn't have, no arms and no legs, he focuses on what he does have. And what is his message? 
It's not about a perfect life. It's about living life with purpose. Is your life, are you living your life with purpose right now? Or are you just kind of mirandering through life? Just kind of happenstance. You know, just kind of like, well, you know, you know, you get up in the morning, hi ho, hi ho, off to work I go. Or I O, I O, I got to go, I got to go. <laughs> Every day's drear. Every day sad. Every day's cl- as <laughs> Every day's cloud, there's a cloud-filled day, even though the sunshine is up, is up there. All the leaves are brown and the sky is gray. I went for a walk on a winter's day. I won't quit. I won't continue. Because <laughs> you guys are singing it right now in your heads, I know. <laughs> is that your life right now? Or you say, content. Are you content? Where God has you, I pray you will. I pray you are. Father, we thank you, God, for you placed each one of us. Do we understand it? No. Nope. Can we comprehend it? No. Nope. But we trust you. I pray, God, that you would help us, Lord Jesus, to be thankful and grateful for all the many blessings you provide us, all the many things you've done for us. Lord, in this life, God, you've been good. All of us should be able to say, Lord, you've been good. Even through trials and tribulations, even through trouble, you have been good. You are good. You doeth all things well. Maybe this evening you're here and you're struggling with uh, your attitude about things. Maybe some area that I spoke about or something this Holy Spirit has spoken to you about. Maybe you're not content. Maybe you're frustrated. Maybe you're comparing yourself with other people. Maybe you find yourself uh, struggling with laziness. Or maybe you're comparing yourself with other people. You're always trying to you know, keep up with the Joneses, trying to, try to better somebody or, or do something more than the other person. Whatever the, whatever the scene of your life you might be in today, you say, Preacher, I'm struggling in some areas. Would you pray for me? Could I pray for you? Anybody like that this evening I pray for? I'm struggling in some things in my life. I need prayer. Let's stand to our feet. If God has spoken in your heart this evening, the piano plays. You'd like to come forward and just kneel at this old altar and ask God to help you. Whatever it may be, whatever struggle you may have, I encourage you to come. Listen to that still, small voice of the Holy Spirit. Ask God to help you in whatever area, whatever difficulty, whatever problem may be. Recognize where you're struggling. Once you recognize it, ask God to give you the ability, the strength, the grace in your time of need. Father, we thank you again for tonight. Thank you for letting us be here and to hear your word. I pray, God, that you would speak to us. We know you have spoken to us. Now, each one of us must decide what we're going to do with it. There may be some that are struggling with some of the things that were mentioned tonight. God, help us in those areas where we struggle. Help us to be honest. Help us to be open. Help us to be transparent. Help us be willing to change. I pray, God, that you'd speak to, continue to speak to each one of us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. May be seated.